<clears throat> yes, Sultan, we can start. Go ahead, yeah, please. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's an absolute privilege to meet you all on a beautiful Saturday morning. On behalf of the Cyber Heels Academy, I am so happy to welcome you all to the panel discussion on cybersecurity could be the game changer in the uncertain 2023. Today, we all are in an age and time, uncertainty is everywhere. That one example we saw through was the entire Corona episode across the globe. People who are so wealthy has become poor, people who are, who are poor become homeless, and people have migrated across the home, we lost our family, and there's so many things have happened. Economy has fallen, this country's on a deep crisis. So what I see is uncertainties are coming uh, much forward, and we all need to prepare for that uncertainty. In the past 10 years, climate change has taken us momentum. People talk about climate change every year, everywhere. Today, sustainability and climate change are the most important discussions that's happening across the globe. But I think we have missed out another important challenge that we all need to speak and need to spread awareness about. Yes, that is cyber security. Cyber security is defined as a bloodless war. It can penetrate into our computers, into our phones to steal private data. Um, financial transaction could be collapsed a country's entire IT infrastructure can also be collapsed. So as much important we talk about climate change, today we are all in a position to talk about cybersecurity as well. And one such initiative is panels like this. Today, our youth are in much, much need of getting awareness about climate change, also about cybersecurity. Um, let's start the first panel of discussion with uh, Dr. Balaji Kaluri. Dr. Balaji has a very prolific profile uh, to add to his um, uh, to his uh, achievements. Dr. Balaji is an alumni of Bits Pilani, ETH Jurich, National University of Singapore, and also the Denmark um, Technical University. Dr. Balaji has also worked for the e-governance department of Tamil Nadu in prioritizing many policies for the government. Um, I leave the forum to hear from Dr. Balaji on the topic, futuristic technology and cyber resilience. Over to you, Balaji. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Sultan and Ibrahim for this opportunity. Uh, and it's it's wonderful to join uh, everyone from, uh, from everywhere. And good morning, uh, you know, for those who are joining from, from Eastern part of the world, and I, I think uh, there are not many from outside. So while I am, uh, you know, pulling up my slide deck, I thought, uh, you know, of when Sultan approached me, I thought of, uh, let's say, thinking about some of the things, uh, initiatives that I've been, you know, uh, spearheading. Um, and, and I'm a sustainable uh, sustainability researcher, predominantly, you know, uh, working in the area of buildings uh, and also urban urban science. So I thought of uh, combining some of the uh, my past experiences and uh, you know and and guiding uh, certain companies uh, globally and also doing some uh, you know uh, research uh, in part collaboration with various uh, research across the world. So I thought of uh, giving you a glimpse of of those to sensitize and pitch uh, you know set the tone for this uh, for this uh, you know uh, panel discussion. So I, I would like to, this is my topic as uh, Sultan has mentioned. It's future technology and cyber resilience. I am uh, an assistant. Professor Professor in the School of Computing and Data Science from Flame University. Um, so before um, before we go uh, any further, so I would like to uh, you know ask everyone uh, what when 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 we talk about future technologies, what comes to your mind? I would like to float this question to everyone here. Maybe you can take a quick uh, you know uh, 10, 20 seconds to throw some answers at uh, uh, answers to the you know audience and uh, all those who are joining now. Any any thoughts? Anything is okay. Sure. Maybe you could uh, open up and speak. Uh, I don't think I'm seeing my chat, but I can see some messages flowing in there. Smart cities. All right. Robots, AI, ML, cybersecurity, smart, Web3. Okay, cool. 
Uh, all right, so you are there. Uh, so it's, uh, and I'm also looking at future technologies, but also the applications of those. Like, uh, I mean, I want you to go in a wild imagination of what what can be really, really futuristic, like flying cars, autonomous cars, or robotic uh, robots doing the surgery uh, on human beings, and let's say drone delivering uh, whatever, whatever uh, your e-commerce e uh, stuff that you order. And uh, let's say smart governance or smart buildings and smart cities. And uh, people are also now talking about uh, clean energy and uh, the power to X, hydrogen fuel cells, so on and so forth. So, so there are uh, plenty of things that we uh, that is happening around the world, and we could uh, combine all this and perhaps uh, give a name uh, future technology, right? So good. Uh, thanks for uh, you know sharing your thoughts. Now let's go further. Uh, next step, uh, which is foresight. So what do you think is foresight? Uh, or how do you start developing foresights and why foresights are important in your view? Can I have again have some uh, thoughts from you guys? IoT, cloud, autonomous. So uh, okay, if there is no so so it's 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 about developing uh, what do you call it? it is about looking into the future, right? Future thinking uh, and often uh, you know there is scientific tools, uh, methods, and frameworks that uh, you know researchers around the world have developed, and there are think tanks guiding several governance nations, uh, organizations to apply uh, strategic uh, foresight into their business and to uh, you know and therefore shape their uh, innovation uh, pipeline uh, in their business and so on and so forth, right? So so that. That is uh, four sites, and I would like to again, uh, you know, share something about uh, a framework that was developed uh, incidentally by an institute uh, which is uh, called the Copenhagen Institute of Future Studies, and this is a framework that, uh, or a tool that you can uh, imagine. And uh, he, uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because we are talking about future technologies, and we need to be aware about how future is developed. Uh, you know, look into the future, develop certain frameworks, and uh, that in turn guides how uh, organizations, governance. Uh, uh, governance policy makers everyone looks into how the society is taking a paradigm shift and what is uh, coming ahead of us in future and therefore one of such that we are talking today is cyber uh, security or cyber resilience right so so if you see this uh, you know uh, image uh, this is uh, this this portrait is precisely at the center which is called global mega trends right so as the name suggests and it is also written there it uh, mega trends have an impact that uh, you know and global mega trends have a part, uh, you know impact that is not just uh, restricted to certain parts of the world or geography, but it has got a global uh, impact or an influence. And uh, the term mega trends, uh, you know, you might have heard trends, but mega trends have typically a sp lifespan of about 15 to 20 years uh, ahead of us, right? So, so they have uh, clearly using scientific methods and tools, uh, they have come up with four broad categories uh, to study the future, right? So one is uh, people, society, technology, world, economy, and there you can see there are 15 uh, mega trends that were out. Uh, you know, portrayed in this uh, visual, right? And you can see that on the technology and science aspect, uh, there are engineering advance advancements. Uh, you know, greater interconnectedness, which is which is which I will touch a little bit in the context of smart buildings and smart cities. Uh, how a greater uh, you know interconnectedness and how engineering advancements are opening up gaps for you know um, uh, cyber. Uh, what do you call risks to arise right so so we uh, and there are a bunch of other uh, you know global trends that, that you may want to look at it, uh, you know later now uh, how organizations I, as, as i mentioned why foresights are important is because organizations needs to you know drive their innovation strategies and pathways for, for how to change their business, how to adapt to, you know, the future, uh, unknown futures, right? So, and here is an applied strategic foresight that uh, a company that I was, uh, you know, advising in Denmark uh, use, right? And uh, especially uh, this one was again guided by Sa Copenhagen Institute of Future Studies in 2009. They came up with this nice uh, chart, which, uh, which shows that uh, there are five major areas, including industry, energy, materials, efficiency, you know, smart cities, data iot blockchain you can see all this and particularly the uh, one of them uh, one of them is the smart buildings and smart cities right so so the company that i was advising was looking at this as a future market uh, you know and how do we how do we adapt our business to the future markets and uh, and and pre uh, precisely this company's uh, interest was uh, or the business was in smart uh, what do you call this uh, security and safety right so 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 that is when i developed uh, insights into how do we look at uh, you know 
uh, what kind of risks come in future? So we are talking about uh, entire the whole global uh, you know paradigm shift in how the societies are being designed, and there are new uh, you know if you look at many things that I've uh, shown here, the central to all this is integrated design. As I mentioned, greater interconnectedness is a global mega trend, one of the global mega trend, and and we see with the data uh, availability, IoT systems, AI, uh, and 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 the availability of advanced networks allows uh, all the different uh, social technical systems to uh, you know put to Together and which we called in technical terms as integrated design, right? So integrated design is central to how the societies are changing, and uh, this is uh, a paradigm shift that we are seeing. Now, what I uh, hear as a statement uh, that we have come up with based on our uh, study, uh, right? Last two years. So the landscape of threats and hazards are going to increase, and we, it is increasing as we speak. Uh, historically, if you look at it, and there are many, uh, you know, um, incidences that I have documented uh, in the last two years, uh, starting from um, you know, a fire uh, risk in a battery storage system in Arizona, USA, and Grand uh, Tower fire in UK in 2017. Data centers that were, you know, uh, that went uh, malfunctioning due to a, uh, you know, a, uh, due to a malfunction of a sprinkler uh, due to the high storage. Uh, what do you call this? Uh, SSDs that were, were that triggered, uh, you know, uh, malfunction of this, and there were other uh, security world has come up with new inventions and in security risks. Domain lamp phone is one of them. Spike is one of them, and you can uh, you have also seen uh, incidences where solar farms have been, uh, you know, hijacked. Uh, and so on and so forth. So, so all this tells that, uh, you know, the landscape of threats and hazards globally, uh, be it any, uh, any industry, it is growing uh, as, we, as we speak, and we can expect that more such incidences and hazards can come into the future with more interconnectedness, right? So that is something that I want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I want you to live and uh, think about. And I would, I would like to, you know, uh, quickly show a case of, uh, a, you know, case study that, uh, that is relevant to perhaps this topic. Uh, we did uh, a case study of a Eurodan house in Denmark, and uh, you know, and imagine this is the, this is a house, this is a real house, and we went into studying how interconnected devices. We, we I am sure everyone is aware about smart house or smart homes. People talk about in India, there are certain developers, uh, you know, uh, pushing this uh, now gradually, but globally people are talking about it, and there are many uh, developers doing it as we speak. Now this is if you can imagine this is how the house is inside and. Uh, you know, appliances that are, in, uh, you know, uh, mobile applications like IF3, Triple T, Alexa, etc., that allows, uh, you know, different devices to be connected. Now, what we did is to apply our strategic foresights to develop plausible scenarios of the future where uh, certain risks can come into such smart homes, right? So, and I would like to, uh, you know, give you a glimpse of those scenarios that we developed. We developed typically 10, and we use that to develop taxonomy of cyber physical uh, risks uh, related to fire safety and security uh, in buildings. And here is an example of one that I want to you know, quickly run run you through. Now, as you see, uh, this is a wireless smoke detector, uh, and it is it it generally communicates when there is a smoke uh, that is detected in the house and to a wireless smoke a fire alarm, and then uh, you know, um, and fire trucks are. Are allowed now, now what happens with this kind of a wireless infrastructure is someone can jam these signals and then uh, open the house unlock it and then uh you know enter right and this sorry, is one such scenario screen is so, not clean. sorry your screen is not changed yeah not visible yeah yeah you yeah. cannot see the uh, automation uh, sorry animation here uh, yeah. ibrahim no no can you change it stop maybe you need to reshare yeah oh yeah 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 i'm sorry uh i switched to another uh just no. a minute Yeah, that's my mistake. Um, I apologize. So I think it should be visible now. Yeah, it's visible. Exactly. Yeah? yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'm talking about this, right? So Eurodan House in Denmark that I did as a case study along with my colleagues uh, in Denmark, and this is that uh, this is a real house uh, image of a real house from outside, and this is how typically the house is designed inside, and there are many appliances uh, which are smart, and uh, <clears throat> the technologies allow uh, today smart home technologies or smart building technologies allow you to interconnect all these different uh, devices, which has got different functionalities, you know, and you can automate it for whatever uh, you know it can be energy uh, energy or convenience or you know uh, um, and so uh, you know improved security of your house uh, safety of your house and so on and so forth so what did we did was to you know lo uh, look at uh, four sites or we took four sites as our um, at, uh, you know 
or a method or a tool and then we develop 10 plausible scenarios uh, of future that uh, that can compromise safety and security in such smart houses right so here is a uh, example of how integrated ceiling windows doors and wireless smoke detectors through a workflow automation app called IFTT can be compromised by a arbiter who can jam these wireless signals uh, previously, so far as we speak, uh, by regulations of the uh, you know the Danish uh, building industry, you cannot have wireless smoke detectors or wireless uh, fire alarms, right? Now, what uh, what people are looking at it uh, for, with the emergence of new technologies, these devices can be connected, uh, you know, wirelessly. But what we we are trying to study here is how these systems can be compromised and how uh, by uh, from uh, by outsiders, right? Here is another uh, you know uh, futuristic scenario. So imagine this is a neighborhood of a of smart houses in one locality and someone uh you know uh, a cyber criminal can hack into these and 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 you know you uh, simulate that there is a fire in this locality and redirect all the fire trucks in the neighborhood or the city to this particular locality and plot a terror attack somewhere in the city right so and this is devastating and people in europe are concerned really about this so how do we develop or apply foresights to come up with you know uh such scenarios uh, and help guide, uh, you know, uh, designers and regulators come up with new guidelines. So this is precisely what we did. And there are plenty of, you know, I developed 10 uh, different scenarios and I would not, uh, you know, take your time, uh, you know, to go through all of them. But but there is a paper and the reference to which is, uh, you know, an article that we published. And if you are for those who are interested there, uh, you know, you can perhaps take a look at that. Um, probably, yeah, probably, right? you can, yeah, probably you can share that. That would be really great. I mean, uh, it is here. Uh, so the, no, uh, the footnote mean, here, if you see, the... there is a link to the article that we published and it was presented in European Safety and Reliability Conference in 2020. Um, <laughs> right? I, I can send it offline for those who are interested and you can contact me if you want to read about this article further. So right? that, we have... A... Kind of a... Yeah. Now, uh, I want to, you know, uh, just conclude with my final words. Like we are now, as uh, Sultan started with, uh, you know, uh, globally, this is a map of, uh, you know, the global map and many paradigms are pushing how we should, uh, how the world should uh, move forward sustainably, you know, uh, etc. Now, we, uh, the, the figure on the left shows the energy trajectories of different countries and nations. How should uh, their carbon footprint be, you know, uh, managed? How should they, uh, you know, approach sustainable development, right? And what I see as a result of this uh, is the central piece that I've put in the figure where uh, data and information as we speak is emerging. And this is, and we are seeing large, uh, you know, more and more that building services, districts, uh, cities, everything is connected, right? And they, as, we, as I, when I say connected, there is information uh, exchange between different systems. And you can imagine the complexity of systems from smaller air conditioners to lights, to fans and safety security in, in a building uh, to, you know, interconnectedness of, let's say, uh, rooftop PVs, you know, and, and other stuff in the district level to the city level. So um, what I say is information is uh, flowing uh, and, be, you know, it is allowing how we imagine designing our cities and districts uh, for towards sustainability. It's pushing that boundaries. And what is important for us to, uh, you know, uh, think therefore is responsible design and innovation management. So, so how do we balance the smartness that, you know, technology offers and how do we balance it against uh, robustness or resilience, right? So uh, against risks and uh, especially in this case, we are talking about cyber physical or cyber risks so how do we uh, how do we make these uh, complex socio technical systems like cities and buildings and districts resilient against uh, you know uh, new forms of risks that we could see in future so i think that's all from me uh, you know and i appreciate your time uh, and patience uh, you know and if you have any further questions you are welcome to you know reach out to me here is my contact details yeah. Thank you so much, Balaji. That's uh, that's an overwhelming illustration of what world is heading towards. Um, I have one question to you, Balaji. Um, today, in this world and time where everything is connected to computer, um, what sort of importance that every startup or every research organization should pay attention to incorporate more models of cybersecurity for the futuristic uh, technologies? Um, 
I think uh, based on what I observed and what I have also described to everyone, so everyone should look at, uh, you know, using all the knowledge that we have around the world, like uh, having a global view, but but still having, you know, local context is important, uh, right? And to look at systems, right? For example, I I'm, uh, I just posted this and we need to have this open mind to, you know, observe. Like yesterday, there was an article that I came across and a study by, you know, uh, my uh, researchers in National University of Singapore, they were, they were looking at you know uh new forms of risks right so you need to be curious to you know uh, look at like i'm talking about the security uh, world so they have come up with uh you know uh, a thought that can can a click of you know uh turning a key you know can be used and captured in the in the uh, by smartphones right and can we unlock a house right so this was this was a concept uh, that they have been looking at right so how how new forms of risk so you need to uh, you know organizations and people who are looking at uh, you know securing organizations have to have an open mind and think about all different ways of innovative ways that uh, new form uh, you know risk can come into any form of environment and business and organization so and they have to be uh, they have to have this and we have to have uh, you know an ecosystem and an organizational structure where innovation is part of this culture and they they uh, you know continuously strive Absolutely. to you know uh, get new knowledge and and use that new knowledge to you know uh, however uh, create the new strategy for their own business or an organization or governance i think that's that's priority number one yeah thank you so much balaji it's it's been a pleasure hearing your perspectives i there's a lot of students been hearing your uh, speech in youtube as well so i'm sure you have put a seed in them so that their innovations comes with precautions you know uh, it's not just an elevation of human status at the same time in terms of using technology at the same time being very precautious is very important so thank you for giving that thought and i thank you so much for joining us here today uh, all the way from jaipur in, in spite of your <laughs> busy schedule um, thank you once yeah, again thank Bhavad. you yep uh, the next speaker today is uh, Dr. Revati Krishnamurti, the director of uh, Miyasi Institute of Information Technology and Science. She has an 18 years of experience in the field of teaching, and she has published quite a lot of papers uh, and research journals. And I personally know Dr. Revati very well, uh, one of uh, bright minds in the Indian Academia. Um, over to you, Revati, madam, and uh, she'll be speaking on a very important and a very interesting topic. Uh, thank you, Sultan, sir, for a nice introduction. And uh, yeah, thank you for the Cyber Hills uh, organizers and panelists and uh, participants for giving me this opportunity. So here my topic is uh, faculty development program. Uh, so here, uh, this is a very, very important uh, today's uh, in today, uh, especially for the faculty members. So here, uh, I want to, I would like to uh, mention the teaching uh, system, both in abroad and uh, India first. That's what I want to mention first. So far in our uh, curriculum, uh, uh, curriculum, we are uh, reading only theoretical part for past uh, 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 two, three decades. Nowadays only it's changing in the fact, uh, in the curriculum, but in the foreign uh, countries abroad uh, and all uh, they they are more into the practical ones, practical ones. And uh, one more thing is uh, I would like to mention here is uh, now the advanced technologies are coming every day, uh, like AI, machine learning, cybersecurity, IoT, and all these. Are, uh, Dr. Balaji mentioned in his uh, talk, all these are all the new trend and technologies are coming. So in this, um, uh, uh, when, when we see this, uh, faculties are um, uh, very lacking in this because, uh, for example, if you take, uh, when, we, uh, when we started our profession in the 90s, uh, early 90s, uh, our advanced technologies are only Oracle 6 and uh, uh, C++ is the highest uh, advanced topics. So after that, now if you see, the um, tremendous changes in uh, technology, software technologies. So we have to, uh, uh, we have, these are all the challenges for faculty members. Uh, in fact, if I tell, so we have to uh, fulfill, uh, we have to uh, learn all these advanced technologies, then only we can uh, uh, compete with uh, others. And uh, moreover, uh, we can give good education to our uh, students. So in this case, uh, this faculty development program is very, very important for us. 
so especially in uh, say, today's topic is cyber security so here uh, what is the uh, importance and uh, importance of this uh, faculty program we have seen now so here this uh, how can we give this uh, faculty program uh, very effectively to the faculty members means so here uh, we can see some of the uh, points so to enhance their uh, faculty develop uh, faculty knowledge and uh, uh, they can uh, skill in their cyber security so that they can uh, educate uh, and train their students in future in these critical areas so uh, uh, first in the a faculty development program we have to design the faculty development program for this uh, in case of in, in the uh, form of cyber security uh, so here yeah, when you design the uh, when you design the uh, uh, program faculty program so this should be very effective effective and it should be very helpful for faculty members to enhance their skills in the cyber security field. So here I would, uh, would suggest some of the key elements uh, to be followed in uh, designing the FDP program in cyber security. So here we need to uh, need to assess uh, the faculty's need through some surveys, interviews, the faculty's existing knowledge of cyber security and their uh, teaching experience and the resources they have available to them, et cetera. All these, uh, we have to do all these surveys before designing this uh, frame for the FDP curriculum. So here, uh, uh, here we need, uh, uh, after taking these assessments, so we, uh, we have to design the curriculum based on this assessment. And uh, here the FDP program, mainly has been designed from basic level to the advanced level. So from basic level means from the fundamentals of the cyber security to the advanced level of the um, uh, topics. There is like uh, penetration testing, cyber security, uh, sorry, cryptography, network security, and all other advanced uh, topics in the cyber security. So, so be, uh, we have to uh, design the curriculum from the basic level to the advanced level. And moreover, this program mainly focused on hands-on experience of uh, hands-on sessions and uh, exercises and uh, real world uh, scenarios for practical ex experiences so and uh, and moreover one more thing uh, the faculties when they learn all these uh, um, concepts through the um, faculty development program and they have to collaborate uh, collaboration is very important the uh, the uh, collaboration is also the main key point here so faculties uh, should be encouraged to collaborate with their peer groups as well as their industry professionals and uh, government uh, agencies to stay up to date on the latest trends and technologies in cyber security so um, and apart from this uh, faculty development programs in cyber security are very very essential for uh, bridging the skills gap in the FDP um, skills gap gap that is the FDPs uh, help us to bridge this gap by training and upskilling uh, the educators that is the faculty members who can then educate the next generation of cyber security professional that may, uh, I mean uh, for uh, next generation students we can uh, transform this knowledge to our students so here starting up to uh, with this uh, emerging threats and uh, Im uh, and uh, improving uh, technical effectiveness and providing them with the new teaching methodologies resources and tools etc is needed very much needed for giving this uh, effective fdp program for the faculty members so here uh, yes, i um, conclude this um, my topic the FDP is very, very important for faculty members and uh, they have to learn, uh, they have to practice on their hands-on experience and faculty co um, collaborate uh, and best practices with, the, with this leads to the address the common challenges and share their uh, knowledge uh, to the future uh, generation. Uh, there is a challenge for this uh, FDP. Uh, and moreover, for, uh, this is the main challenge for faculty members also to learn each and every day we have to update ourselves for these uh, advanced trends. Then only we can uh, educate our students. The quality of uh, education is very, very important now. So uh, when you give the quality of the, uh, in, uh, improve the quality of the uh, uh, faculty members, then only they can educate the students and uh, they can bring the quality of education. Uh, in all advanced technologies and 
our students also they can compete with the real world competitions so for all these things this faculty program is very very important and this is a need and our i can i can say uh, thank you sustan sir thank you for giving this opportunity to share my thoughts uh, in this as a faculty thank you thank you so much uh, revathi madam that was uh, one of a kind a uh, true testimony of how the academy should evolve to serve the future needs i thank you so much for that i have one specific uh, question to you as such a leading academician in one of the elite institutions in tamil nadu um do you think um our academic institutions are taking enough steps or necessary mandates um to develop faculties right now if not what sort of initiatives that they should uh, take in terms of collaborating with uh, training organizations or industry uh, or uh, um, organizations that are doing practical things in serving um, education in a different way uh, yes sir <clears throat> yes you can sir uh, i would like to answer for your question uh, yeah Uh, FDP is very very important. Uh, of course, I said uh, so. Here uh, uh, for all the participants, uh, I am coming from NIAS Institute of Information Technology uh, in Chennai. So here, uh, uh, especially in our institutions, what we are doing is uh, we are conducting more number of faculty development programs for our faculty members to upskill their knowledge in advanced technologies. so uh, uh, like cyber security uh, artificial intelligence iot etc so here the thing is not only learning the theory parts as well as we have to learn full fledgedly we have to learn the practical sessions also for our practical faculty members so here uh, for example uh, if i uh, I, i would like to share our own experience uh, here today uh here uh, we uh, recently we conducted two faculty development programs online faculty development programs of five days uh, uh five, um, totally 1500 participants from all over the in all over india and all over the world they attended our faculty faculty development program so here uh, uh we have given uh, in uh, all different uh, topics uh, one uh, one of uh, one day se- session was uh, dr ibrahim's uh, from cyber hills they have given the cyber security so here i would like to share my uh, um, uh, point here how the faculty development program is very very important for faculty members so here uh, through our institute uh, through our faculty development program Uh, dr ibrahim he openly uh, uh, committed in his uh, session that uh, those um, uh, he has given the chance to the faculty members that is the professors from various institutions uh, to attend this uh, uh, cyber security certification courses and for free of cost and uh, uh, i would like to thank dr ibrahim sir for sir ibrahim sir for uh, rendering a service to the society Uh, thank you sir thank you brain sir so through is uh, uh, through uh, after after our faculty development program nearly 50 members or uh, 50 professors from various institutions we all attended uh, uh, this course and we benefited out of it and uh, it's cost around uh, 50000 uh, i think but it is uh, given the free of cost for all the faculty members uh, from various institutions uh, for developing Uh, uh this fdp and here the main thing is uh, he insisted us is uh, i would like to appreciate his uh, service mind and uh, one more thing is what is his uh, future vision is so if if we educate the professors and or there is the faculty members automatically it will reach their students that is his vision so really we have to appreciate uh, this this thing for uh, uh, dr ibrahim sir thank you sir thank you very much uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much and uh, through this faculty one more thing i want to tell you so uh, from our prestigious institute uh, he has given three for three faculty we are very lucky to have uh, three faculty members including me we got the certification for uh, uh, seven certifications from uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, 40 net and seven certifications we have done for free of cost and uh, today i am very very confident that uh the cyber security is uh, very friendly with us uh, and uh, moreover both theoretical and uh, practical sessions also he has given uh, so it's a very uh, nice course and out of this uh, fdp program we benefited and uh, today 
So I'm handling the cyber security for our students uh, very confidently after attending this uh, um, uh, certification courses. Because of, Thank you so much, madam. Uh, Thank you so much for your so kind what testimony. I, what I would uh, feel is this faculty through like this faculty these through uh, uh, this kind of faculty program it should be reached to yeah, all the professors, those who are uh, uh, those who want to update themselves. So compulsorily we have to give give it to them, and they have to update their knowledge uh, in current trends, and they have to transform their knowledge to their students. And in that way, we can improve the quality of education. And also our students, they can compete with the uh, industry point of view in future. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Revati, madam. It's uh, it's absolute pleasure hearing you. Um, I The next speaker for today is uh, Dr. M. Vanita, Associate Professor at Savita Engineering College. Uh, Dr. Sav um, uh, Dr. Vanita has a huge experience in the field of academy and research. Um, today, she's going to talk about uh, fill the gap between cybersecurity curriculum and industry requirement. Um, I do understand it's just a thin line of difference between what uh, Dr. Revati Madam spoke, uh, but you will hear many different perspectives uh, in terms of uh, modifying our existing curriculums to, uh, to industry standards. Over to you, Dr. Vanita Madam. Yeah, thank you, Sultan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ibrahim, sir, for uh, giving me this opportunity. Able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. Very clear. Yeah. Oh, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Well, uh, this is Vanita from Savita Engineering College. <clears throat> Sorry, I have a very bad throat now. <clears throat> I really feel very happy to be a part of this uh, discussion panel among distinct personalities <coughs> from various domains. I would like to focus on a few points about expanding demand for cybersecurity personnel in industry and about how to improve the cybersecurity curriculum in order to minimize the knowledge gaps. Now, a wide range of skills like technical skills, <coughs> implementation skills, management skills are all very much required in new cybersecurity graduates. The internet plays critical role in almost all our lives every day and uh, slowly it becomes indispensable. The risk it brings threatens our life as well as the digital world causing serious losses. So in recent years, some universities started to provide <laughs> cybersecurity courses as a part of engineering course. Initially, these courses were offered as an elective course and now the need in the field of cybersecurity has recently intensified because many operations are performed online, like e-banking, online shopping, and uh, e-government operations. So the courses started to transform into compulsory courses in several programs. Hence, uh, reducing the gap between curriculum and industry is very important for several reasons. Let us uh, now discuss one by one. The first reason for why the gap between the curriculum and industry must be reduced is to prepare the students for the workforce. For the primary goal of education is always to prepare the students for their job, basically. Uh, that is nothing but the workforce. When there is a gap between the curriculum and industry, what happens? Students will not be adequately prepared for the skills and the knowledge that the employers usually require. Ultimately, this can result in a skills mismatch where the graduates will find it difficult to find an employment or they may require additional training once they enter the workforce. Next reason is to address their skill shortages. Many industries, including the technology industry, are facing <clears throat> scarcity of skills. When there is a gap between the curriculum and industry, it can exacerbate these shortages. So by reducing the gap between the curriculum and the industry, the academic programs can really help the students ensure that they are possessing the skills and knowledge which are in demand. And with that, they can address the skill shortages. The next key point, uh, the next key point is enhancing industry academic partnerships. When there is a gap between curriculum and industry, it will become a barrier between academic and industry. So we have to reduce the gap obviously by means of education to make them build stronger partnership between academia and industry. 
which will lead to greater collaboration, research opportunities, and internships, and in turn, the job, job placements for the students. The uh, next point can be improving innovation and competitiveness. This is another important thing uh, for which we need to fill the gap between the curriculum and the industry. In industries that are heavily influenced by the latest technologies like cybersecurity, innovation is very critical. So by reducing the gap, academic programs can ensure the students that they are exposed to the latest technology developments and techniques, which will lead to greater innovation and competitiveness. Next, in order to meet the regulatory requirements, it is necessary to fill the gap. Many industries, including finance, healthcare, et cetera, they have regulatory requirements that will impact their operations. It can be challenging for the students to understand and comply with the day-to-day -day requirements. By reducing the gap, students will be aware of these requirements and they will get prepared to comply with them. From all the above reasons which I have pointed out, I would like to summarize that reducing the gap between curriculum and industry is important because it prepares the students for the workforce, it addresses skill shortages, it enhances industry academic partnerships, it improves innovation and competitiveness in order to meet all the regulatory requirements. Uh, with this, I conclude my topic saying that filling the gap between curriculum and industry is really very significant in all aspects in education scenario. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Sir? Sir, you are in Ma'am, thank you. So, thank you so much for your very kind words of wisdom. Um, it has truly given us uh, an essence of how our curriculum should be evolved in order to match um, the existing uh, requirements of education. Uh, I have one question to you. Um, in case, you know, we know a country like India where, where the education system is not very flexible and we constantly need uh, mandatory regulations from the UGC or from the centralized universities to embark on uh, new curriculums. In such a case, what autonomous universities and autonomous institutions or institutions that are already affiliated to uh, central universities can take necessary uh, steps to you know, equip them with um, in closing the gap between academia and industry? Yes, sir. Actually, uh, previously it was being offered as elective subject, which may not be compelled for the students to uh, definitely study the subject. But being autonomous institution, we are providing an opportunity for them that they can choose elective subject from their own uh, department as well as from the other departments. Now, slowly we are bringing in the uh, cyber security related courses into the curriculum for every department because it has become very crucial nowadays because each and every person, every common man is dealing with uh, all uh, online activities like social media, online shopping, payment, key government service, etc. So it is not that only those people who are working in that domain should know about the issues and how to deal with them. It, uh, it has been very necessary that every man should be aware of it and so education only is the only way to uh, which plays a vital role in uh, knowing about the issues and how to handle it so slowly we are bringing in this type of courses as a compulsory course or a mandatory course in every department uh, as of now the uh, electronics and communication department information technology and com computer science department has brought in this course almost all the students are studying Slowly, it will become a mandatory course for all the departments as well. Um, thank you so much, uh, Vanita, Madam, for your kind message. Now, um, we have the new speaker now, uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar. is currently a professor in the School of Electronics Engineering at Vellur Institute of Technology Chennai Tamil Nadu has completed his PhD in wireless communication network security at Pondicherry University. Um, he has done his BTEC from Rajiv Gandhi College of Engineering and Technology Puducherry in the year 2004 and MTech from Pondicherry Engineering College. He has various affiliations from ISTE to IET to CSI to IAENG. He has received so many awards for his contribution to the research from Vailur Institute of Technology and from other organizations. He 
has the area of specialization in artificial intelligence with cybersecurity, hardware security, cryptographic algorithms, ML and DL algorithms, blockchain technology, and some of those most advanced things that we might want to know today. Um, he has more than 10 granted patents, and he's truly a pioneer in the field of education. Um, and we will hear from him on the topic. Research and development. Research and development, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vijay, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Sutan sir, and also Mohammed Ibrahim sir, uh, for giving the opportunity uh, to talk about. My voice is audible to you, I think so. Yes, sir, it's audible, yeah, but thank you, thank low. You. Yeah, now it's better. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, there are a new uh, uh, technology uh, came into the market nowadays. Uh, so, one of the uh, thing is our uh, cyber security field. So this will place uh, uh, this will be the opportunity for the research and development projects um, for many um, private as well as uh, government sector. Uh, so few things uh, I am going to discuss uh, where your R and D projects uh, plays a role. Uh, so first one is in terms of uh, security analytics. Um, so if this is the uh, security analytics is a major thing nowadays uh, needed by the uh, most of the IT organization, as well as uh, uh, many R&D sectors, uh, research labs. Um, so the, uh, the tools involved in the particular uh, uh, help you to detect and uh, uh, respond for the cyber security threats uh, in real time. So uh, the R&D projects involved in this particular area um, uh, help you to give the better solution uh, by involving the new uh, concepts like uh, machine learning and the artificial algorithms um, to analyze the large amount of data to identify the threats and the anomalies. So that is uh, a major thing. Another point uh, I'm going to talk about uh, on uh, uh, cloud security. Uh, so cloud security is also the very uh, famous uh, um, computing technology you know, it is, uh, uh, most of the IT organization we are uh, uh, looking towards for the research development. Uh, so if you add the uh, cybersecurity concept uh, in your uh, cloud security platform, uh, then that will uh, give the better uh, uh, solution to you to protect the cloud-based data as well as applications. Uh, so again, our uh, R&D projects in this area, uh, they focus and then they develop the many innovative uh, uh, security solutions uh, which uh, which can uh, which will be uh, give the better um, uh, solutions for the issues and challenges uh, arising in our cloud security and other one is uh, internet of things security so you know very well nowadays in uh, uh, throughout the world uh, the devices are connected by means of uh, internet and then we are getting the advantage of uh, in the field uh, medical environment as well as agriculture field uh, and, also many, and also in the education sector also. Uh, so to give the security for the IoT, again, uh, cybersecurity gives the better uh, uh, solution to protect the IoT devices from the cyber attacks. So for these R&D projects, uh, they developed the many communication protocols, authentication methods, encryption techniques, uh, how the securely the IoT devices uh, share the information with the um, IoT servers. Um, so, in that case, you are, um, uh, if, if you focus more on your R&D projects on this particular IoT uh, security related protocols, then that will give the uh, better uh, solution. And in other way, cryptography, cryptography is a, a very important component in our cyber security. So, there are many uh, innovative projects is going on in uh, uh, cryptography. Uh, so, um, by developing the new algorithms, new protocols uh, for the uh, industry as well as uh, for the research uh, um, technology, um, so your cryptography plays a vital role. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the, the new cryptography techniques such as our uh, uh, elliptical cryptography as well as uh, uh, pairing based cryptography and uh, your uh, lattice based cryptography. Uh, which is fully focused on a quantum uh, physics, quantum uh, attacks. 
So these uh, cryptography techniques uh, plays a vital role uh, to give the better solution for the resource constant devices like our IoT. So the R&D projects involved in this particular uh, um, area will uh, give the better uh, uh, solution um, for our uh, cyber in terms of cyber security. And other one is cyber security education. So that is very, very important. So we have to. Uh, uh, conduct uh, so many um, so as uh, other uh, professors mentioned uh, we have to conduct uh, uh, some uh, uh, teaching and development activities uh, uh, about the technology as with the methods as the tools uh, involved in our uh, cyber security uh, for the researchers as well as for the uh, professional uh, lecturers uh, as well as uh, for the r&d development uh, sector trainers so that will uh, definitely help you to uh, improve the or knows the awareness uh, about the r and d uh, projects uh, uh, for the towards the cyber security education so that is the main thing and, and other topic is uh, threat intelligence so by increasing the you know variable we are having uh, uh, many cyber threats nowadays so we need uh, certain uh, tools, threat intelligence tools we need uh, that will help you to uh, um, uh, avoid those at potential attacks. So in this case also, you are, our R&D projects based, uh, um, what you call the cyber security based R&D projects uh, helps to focus on uh, developing the many innovative tools uh, that can able to collect and analyze the uh, uh, third intelligence based data and uh, data help you to identify the potential threats and also uh, the vulnerability which has happened to the um, uh, sector. So yeah, I think not only uh, the particular organization, uh, uh, many organizations who they are, where they are involving the uh, force machines as well as uh, network servers as well as the websites, uh, they are uh, affected by the third intelligence. So. Um, R&D projects will focus on this particular threat indices. We will give the better solution um, for by developing the innovative tools uh, to avoid the uh, potential attacks and the vulnerabilities uh, uh, towards this threat indices. Uh, so, um, in summary, um, there are numerous op opportunities for R&D and projects in cybersecurity. Uh, so, ranging from uh, uh, security analytics. Uh, IoT security, uh, as well as uh, many cryptographic algorithms are there, as well as uh, cloud securities uh, and uh, threat intelligence. So these projects have potentially to make a significant impact on the cybersecurity industry and also help to, to protect the individuals and organizations from uh, cyber threats. So we have to give the proper um, solution uh, through the R&D uh, sector uh, to uh, help them to design and build uh, and also to review the uh, security postures and also uh, security monitoring of IT deployment solutions across the uh, organization. And if you do more focus on your uh, um, uh, R&D sector, uh, either in our uh, um, education sector or in the IT sector research lab, so that help you to uh, manage uh, and also that will help you to uh, give the in-depth knowledge uh, about the architectures uh, as well as uh, uh, troubleshooting procedures uh, for the uh, employees who are all in, uh, took part in the particular uh, uh, area, and also uh, it, it, it it this this will plays a major uh, role uh, and as a responsible for overall design and the deployment for the uh, company uh, who are all working towards to configure and uh, test and maintain their own uh, devices uh, in a security way. So this is the way our R&D uh, development uh, uh, towards our cyber security uh, will help for the future uh, technology. So thank you for the giving the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much uh, for your uh, words of wisdom, especially in the field of um, research. Uh, hearing it from you, someone who have done a lot of work in the field of cybersecurity, blockchains, and all the other technologies related to uh, network security is, is a truly um, an eye-opener and a whistleblower uh, for most of us here. 
Um, if I can ask one question um, to you, especially, um, how it is important, not only just learning theoretical stuff, but also um, practicing some of those theoretical learnings into practical modules to do little projects uh, during college days, especially in the field of artificial intelligence or uh, blockchain or cybersecurity would enhance the the quality of students to be a better employees for the future. Um, I would like to hear from you on that line. So. Yes, sir. Actually, nowadays, uh, most of the IT uh, uh, recruitment uh, process, uh, they are towards the cybersecurity uh, solutions only. So even in our uh, university also, we are uh, we conducted uh, so many trainings towards our uh, uh, cybersecurity area, and we especially uh, trained them uh, to uh, make them involved for the tools related to the security. Uh, so like that, we are having uh, we are training them uh, how to uh, do the ethical hacking and also how to um, do the. Uh, analysis about the malware, uh, malicious codes, as well as how to detect the intruders uh, in the network. Uh, so like that, uh, we will give the training uh, to the students. And uh, as a result, uh, what happened is, they go for uh, um, placement. Uh, so the where, where, exam, where the organization, uh, they need the uh, security analyst, or where they need the penetration tester or vulnerability analyst, uh, like that, so they uh, easily they uh, pick the student uh, for their uh, employment purpose. So um, not only by teaching, um, but we are pro by giving the um, hands-on experience to the students. Uh, definitely, that will help them to give the awareness about the new technology, like uh, new tools and technologies, uh, which is involved in our cybersecurity area. So. That is it. Yeah, you are muted, sir. You are muted. You are muted. You are muted. Yeah. Thank you once again for your kind oh, words. Yes, thank you, thank you. We are looking forward to collaborate more with you in terms of sure, uh, sure, doing sure. small projects for students in the future. Sure, sure. sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, the next speaker today is uh, Mr. Shiva. Uh, Dr. Shiva has a very prolific uh, education background. From, um, from Lila College Sociology to Madras Christian College, MA in Public Administration. Uh, from LLB from Tamil Nadu, Dr. Ambedkar Law University. And Science Po uh, from France. And also he went to uh, America to do um, um, his law degree as well. And he was the former advisor to the um, governor of Washington, D.C. And Dr. Shiva works for Indus Action as the, the director of the Southern Region. Um, he has done quite a lot of work in the field of policy making for uh, security services. Um, he also currently uh, working as an advisor to the Tamil Nadu e-governance department. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear from uh, Dr. Shiva. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sultan. And for all the wonderful speakers who had their share of wisdom. Um, I'm just trying to make sure that this, uh, this does not go into a um, very technical aspect. So because if there is, if there is audience who are not very uh, convenient or conversant with the cyber laws, so I'll make as much as possible to make it uh, readable and understandable. Uh, so uh, I'm, a, I'm an advocate and I also am a policy advocate who works especially on the e-governance, and that's where we work, where, which uh, to contextualize, I work for Tamil Nadu e-governance, which has got, uh, we're creating Muckle ID and the Muckle portal. If you, I think some of you would have had uh, a brush on the newspaper. So we have about the entire database of the state and the crucial conversations that all the time happens in the premises is protection of data, and uh, what are the laws and what are the policies that will enable to make sure, ensure that the data is protected within the premises and within the, <clears throat> the government convents. And um, especially when there was to be a conversation where we wanted to work in, in a different uh, office, 
So the commissioner of the organization would say, please use the Wi-Fi of this premises because this is secured and encrypted. And that will also help us from liabilities in the court of law. So uh, as, a, as a prelude, I'm just making sure that I'm contextualizing what I'm speaking. And um, let me just start with the, a few ideas and then go into the laws and policies of it. So, um, well, there is a lot of information and there is a lot of data services, but on the flip side grows the risk and an ever, ever increasing need for strong cybersecurity laws. And it could be a, or accidental or intentional. That, that's another way of looking at crime. Being a lawyer, I'm going to use the words which is more law pertinent, but it does have the capacity to disrupt the supply of essential services. Uh, like take the example of Ukraine attack in 2016, the water and electricity and Iran and every power grid that was attacked by Iran, people claim that is Iran or it is US against Iran. But uh, the point is there is a premonition that any essential services of a state could be disrupted by cyber attacks. So this is something, and uh, while I was going through a few of the articles that I worked in cybersecurity, technology and intelligence during my course in Sciences Po in Paris, and uh, I came across a, uh, an article, I don't know, it was just, just coincidental today morning in the Hindu about uh, a recent attacks and uh, on Ames Hospital, and it took about 40 million health records, which was a ransomware attack. So ransomware is something it's like uh, to explain it simple. Someone locks your game and asks you to, if you want to play the game again, it's like just to make sure it, for kids, if you're a kid and if you have games and somebody locks the game and tells them that you have to do all of this, only then I'll unlock the game. So while you can play, that's what ransomware is. And being all professionals here, I don't want to explain it more. So it's a ransomware attack. 40 million health records were taken as a ransom. And uh, to resume control, it took about two weeks. And the two weeks were the time it was exposed and the vulnerability they made. Likewise, I think it was Black, Black Cat, uh, which breached the parent company of solar industries. And one of them, uh, it was a defense ammunition and explosive manufacturers and it expected about two terabytes of data. So likewise, if you see data shows that 75% of the Indian organizations have faced such attacks with each breach costing an average of 35 pro to recover the damage. And recently Air India, the files of them, about 4.5 million customers were leaked in a cyber attack and about 180 million users were stolen straight out of Domino P sites. So uh, uh, just to give the quantum of what's the amount of data that is created in a day, it's about 2.5 quintillion bytes a day is being produced uh, in every day by your use, my use, by the way we're talking now, this is the data that is created. Uh, these are threats that's, that's there everywhere. And just in 2021, 2022, cyber incidents involved uh, revolving unauthorized access and compromising personal data. The number of crimes that were reported were about two lakh. And just in a matter of three months in 2022 and in 2023 starting, it's about two lakh crimes, which is the entire time of 2018, but that happened in just three months. So this is the quantum of how much it takes to uh, every organization's experience. And, um, and the most of it, 80% of the attacks resulting in encryption of data and in comparison, the average percentage of attacks was about 65%. And uh, uh, leaving the data with induction, introduction of 5G and the arrival of uh, quantum computing, the, poten the potency of uh, malicious software and uh, avenues for digital security breach would only significantly increase. India's cyber strategy would do well uh, to overlook these actuality and trends with the uh, digital infrastructure in the wake of pandemic and the new updated improved regulatory mechanisms for strengthening cybersecurity. It is evolving. India is getting there, but I'm not sure if we are still on par with the global cybersecurity frameworks that is there in place now. Uh, I, I think one of the main problems from my, my limited knowledge and resource and, um, is 
we have an unclarified and outdated status of uh, all of the laws and policies that we have. We are evolving, but we are not there. Also, I think we have to give some credit to India because in 2000 was the first ever law created for cyber laws and protection. So we are like, a, we are young kid in the block. So we are evolving. And uh, so uh, how much does it cost as a cyber crime cost an economy? The global, like globally, if you see, to give a and perspective of the revenue that is involved in protecting data and crimes, law, all of this is about $3 trillion, which is the economy, the, the cyber crime mechanisms or protections that has been taking place in USA, which is more than many of the country's national GDP. US spends about $3 trillion. $3 trillion. And, um, and the cost of global economies per hour is $7 lakh. Dollar. Over the cost, over the year, the amounts of six billion, six billion dollars has been lost in fighting the cyber criminals. So this year, the crime uh, crimes are expected to cost damage more than uh, eight trillion eight trillion dollar economy. And uh, the countries include U.S., Russia, United Kingdom, South Korea, and Europe, EU. And uh, to give the time and space a little more uh, perspective, with an average of ninety seven cyber crime victims per hour. 97 victims per hour and that means the every 37 seconds there is a crime that is happening that is right now in addition two internet users have had their data leaked every second by the time we're talking in every single second there is two user data has been leaked and improvement over 2021 2022 23 six user data and now it is about 10 user data have been leaked yesterday i was just making a random check in my laptop of uh, Google's own way of verifying threats, two of my uh, my logins somewhere have been compromised. So I had to change the passwords. And uh, who does it affect? Less than 20 is the most vulnerable and over to 60 is the highest number of people who've been affected. So maybe it's the ease of access for young people and not care about privacy maybe one. And I can see from the, the speakers here who are into academics and who are uh, having the authority uh, for giving a safe place for children. I think that uh, below 20, that's a good target space what we're talking about. And then again, post 60, again, new to technology and or, or maybe late to technology is also one of the reasons why that's also there. So it's about uh, nine, one lakh victims over 60 and the phenomenal number younger than that is how they look at the statistics. So, which means like, I think, I don't know if I could safely call the 30 to 50 as most prudent, but that's that's what the statistics says. And uh, the digital transformation, RTX cybersecurity laws, lack of clear comprehensive data privacy law, Indian government has begun to reevaluate how it can regulate cybersecurity and crimes. And, uh, so before, uh, and my final section I wanted to go is, I do have a lot of all the laws that are there. It's been from 1800s or 1900s, we've been having some kind of laws from, I'm talking about the Indian Penal Code, uh, but the most important one and the contemporary one, and not to bore, bore you with all of this data of uh, crimes and statutes. The Budapest Convention in 2001, was is the only legally binding international instrument on the issue. This gives a guideline on how each of the country could legislate for their country, laws that can protect cyber, cyber crimes. And uh, this is where um, I think we have somehow caught up with, and now we have established our own um, framework. The five key elements of the Budapest Convention was criminalization of cybercrime. So criminalize the cybercrime offenses to an extent of civil and criminal offenses. So there is enough quantum of uh, crimes and there is penalty for it. And uh, cross-border cooperation, which is again a key issue. If you look at uh, GDPR, the EU's data protection law and the localization of data is very key in Europe uh, to make it simple, Facebook, Google, any of the social media or uh, organizations that, are, that have the data storing capacities in the US, 
will have to store their data within the premises, within the 27 countries of the EU, and not take that data back to California. And that is what the GDPR established. So, but that, that does have an issue of crimes established in Europe, having a strike somewhere in America or India or China. Now the cross-border extraterritorial jurisdiction of how crimes can be dealt with is still a problem because we don't have a framework, global framework that allows the lawyers to prosecute crimes that happen in other territories. So that is one that they've been talking. India is, an, India is not a signatory. This is something that I wanted to talk about it, uh, want to mention, not talk about it. Because the Budapest Convention is one legal framework that is all over, it's a global convention, but India has is not been signed. And since 2001, we have been set out of that, that we are not, we have refused to sign that. And protection of personal data is another one where uh, personal data, how much you can control, what is the legal framework that you can use to control. These are the guidelines and how do you build capacity and uh, what is the private sector involvement in this? Be India being a service sector, India being not the manufacturing hub, but being a service giant, we do process a lot of data with this IT boom. And uh, But now we don't know how to control. We are figuring it out. So that's, that's one of the areas which the guidelines specify. And then there are two words which I want to use now or to give is cyber sovereignty. This is where all of this happens. Being very now being a policy person, I'm taking the hat of a lawyer and going to a sovereign uh, of a policy person. If you have the policy like China, if you control the walls so strict that your data cannot go out and your data cannot come in, then there is a problem of digital cross border transfer of data, which means the global economy might crumble. And then the data localization, which I already referred to, if Facebook's data of Europeans should stay in Europe and it should not go to California. The processing might become capitalistically, economically unviable. And uh, so uh, the new bill that we have now coming to the last point, last segment of my conversation is uh, India's draft of digital personalization, personal protection bill 2022 proposes a 500 crore for data breaches. The government believes in its current form and the proposed law leaves sufficient window for adaptation as the, as because what the government thinks is we wanted to evolve. So we are keeping a little open of all the laws. We are not going to be very strict and set in, set in stone. So as and when we go forward, as and when new issues of uh, digital crimes happen, we can evolve the law. This is how they have presumed it. Uh, out of which there are, uh, again, just uh, three or four areas that I wanted to cover before concluding is how do you cover the digital personal data is anything that pertains to be doing in digital sphere and space will be covered under it. Before there were a few personal exceptions, but now every data that is going through it, again, they have left out the manual data, which is still relevant. How to merge the personal data and the manual data to bring it under the ambit of law, it's still out there. Maybe the final version or the law that the act that has been passed as the law of 2022, maybe that should answer something. And then the, and, um, the deemed consent is again a word that I wanted to mention, which is there in this draft, which is again talking about how a user is giving consent to use the personal data. And that has been shared if they have used an idea of if I'm using, if I'm giving a consent voluntarily, that should just enough, that should be enough. There cannot be further claims of saying that you, I didn't give a consent personally, somebody else gave me a content, consent. So that's one, but that does have an issue on personal safety and public interest. Ease of cross-border data flows, which I've already mentioned from the Budapest Convention, that they do want to allow countries and territories notified by the central government, which means the government now has an absolute power over determining which countries the data can free flow and which countries will not allow. And, uh, and uh, an innovative, creative clause that have been added is the right to post-modern, post-mortem privacy. Uh, so even after your death, you can actually hire, you can, you can give a legal will or a hire where you can say that the data might stand and uh, you, 
the right to right to privacy could come into a point in this one and um, the other laws i don't want to talk much about it and because it's like too long and uh, i would just want to finish it up saying um, uh, with the lines between physical and digital realms blurring rapidly every critical infrastructure from transport power banking would become extremely vulnerable to assaults from hostile state and non actors and uh, india has been significantly moving forward but we must take uh, as individuals we must also take a responsibility on online actions take steps to protect ourselves from cyber threats we can create a safe and a more secure space for all but a lot of individual prudence have to take care uh, thank you all for the time um thank you so much uh, uh, mr shiva for your valuable insights you know it's a matter of policies everywhere no matter whether it's education or national security or banking um whatever it could be the sort of policies that defines the actions of a nation and also the protocols of the nation and I, i'm very certain people like you are paying more contribution towards uh, some of the uh, most important cyber policies that we all are governed by i i thank you for joining us here today um moving on to the next speaker we have uh, dr ibrahim uh, dr ibrahim is one of the a uh, well known cyber tech security trainer across the globe uh, he has more than 25 years of experience in the field of cyber security even before we all know uh, the term cyber security he was doing wonders in that field and he is the co-founder and also the um, ceo of cyber heels uh, and also the eb mentorship program um today i i saw many questions that you all were posting like how to find job in cyber security um i've been watching those comments on the comment box now you have your questions answered through dr mohammed ibrahim and i welcome you on the floor sir to speak more about uh, the role of cyber security in redefining uh, job security in the future okay uh, thanks uh, dr sultan and uh, i thank all the uh, distinguished uh, speakers for your time and to enlighten the audience with the vast experience you have in your field especially i was delighted to see uh, industry experts uh, professors and lawyers uh, coming together and addressing such a panel discussion you know that's something i think unique because most of the time we see uh, people who are coming from mncs talking about cyber security sometimes we see uh, people from academia coming and talking about cyber security uh, but it is very rare to see a combination of cyber law you know academics and industry experts coming together and sharing their insight about cyber security i think this is a really wonderful uh, panel and wonderful discussion so far and definitely it's going to uh, create a lot of eye openings and interest and enthusiasm on uh, the students and professors and as well as uh, working professionals in cyber security so with that introduction let me start <clears throat> my session and my topic today is about how to start your career in cyber security at no cost yeah that is very important because my target is now about students my mainly uh, you know about the professors student community that's what i want to focus because that's where we have a huge opportunity we have a huge resource base and we have a huge opportunity in these areas right so let me just quickly run through <clears throat> my presentation i think it should be is it visible for everyone yeah wonderful okay great so i just want to touch upon job opportunities and what is the market scope in cyber security uh, we heard about r and d we heard about faculty development we heard about uh, you know innovation future technologies um, but one thing i always believe uh, for digital transformation to be completed you need to have security transformation to happen in parallel yesterday i was in rit institute institute addressing uh, about future of ai in cyber security that is there was my topic Uh, with the professors and students one thing i stressed to everyone is that without cyber security whatever 
transformation we are doing. It could be smart cities, smart buildings. It could be e-governance. Uh, it could be you know online learning system, gamings, you know e-commerce. You no, know, we can think about a lot. But we don't have a proper security framework, security policies. We don't know where to evolve, how to become a higher maturity model. Then all the efforts, it's like you are preparing everything in a plate and giving to the hackers. Giving to someone to easily you know, take your data. That's why there was one nice uh, you know, cartoon which was released about when people were storing the files, the paper, we were talking about paperless, you know, era, right? Previously, we had paper based. So they're talking about a room with a bunch of files. It's like if you go to it, still in government offices, you find files, you know, bunch of files. I think uh, Mr. Shiva agrees with me that still there is no transformation in most of the government offices. Still, they're working on paper based, yeah? So if we go to, the, there was a nice um, uh, cartoon which was saying that those people who have done those days when we had all of them written in paper, put in storeroom, stockpiled those papers inside a room, we did not hear about data breach. <laughs> we did not hear about, you know, they have taken data from bank, they have taken data take from other card and so on and so forth. But when we had digital transformation, all the data is what you call, call it as, confidential data is now available for, you know, in the internet. So that that anyone who is smart enough and who are criminal enough, and I don't call it as smart enough, who has criminal enough uh, in, in his thinking can easily to, take, the, do, take those data and publish in dark web and make, you know, some uh, you know, money out of it. So that is the difference. They were saying one picture with the world room, another one with, you know, data breaches. So it's a debate, right? Can we say that we'll shut down everything and go back and live in this world is? No, we are adopting, we are changing. So what is the main element missing is security transformation. That's what I think most of you talked about. My point is, yeah, I want to do security transformation and I look for resources and where is the resource? That's a big gap. There are more than 3.5 million job openings in cybersecurity. We're talking about 35 lakhs. And every year it remains the same because once you fill up, that's coming up. And it is the most secure and job. When you talk about the people, they're saying that, no, they're the last one to be getting fired. So we are here to create that workforce for our country because India is going through massive digital transformation. Right from the central government to state government, we see that the technology transformation initiative, startup, I will talk about Tamil Nadu, startup Tamil Nadu, you know, IT transformations. We are, we are talking about bringing $1 trillion business economy and IT has to create $100 billion. So you are preparing everything without a proper workforce. That's something which everybody has to, you know, think about it. From the governments to the colleges, universities, companies have to think about how I can create workforce. That is very, very important. That's what I am going to address today. Yeah. So the job market growth, if you look at cybersecurity, it's we're talking about 100 billion is projected in 2025. It was 10 billion in 2022, 2020. They are expecting like 100 billion, it's almost 10 times growth in five years. That's huge. Average growth rate of 15% or 12% you know, growth rate. And we know that 3.5 million cybersecurity positions are open worldwide. That shows the huge opportunity for us, for students, professors, academia, you know, companies to look up what kind of business we are looking at, what kind of demand in this market. And they're talking about this from Glassdoor. The minimum salary of a fresher starts at five, you know, go up to 20 lakhs per month. Yeah. Sorry, 20 lakhs per annum in India. We're talking about that huge market opportunities in India. When you talk about US, you can, you know, convert it into US dollars. 
am I right? We're talking about $60,000 to $120,000. Huge opportunity. Yeah. And if you go and search, because sometimes when we put numbers, it's hard to believe or hard to understand. I would request all the participants to go to in naukri.com or any other job site and go and search soft opening in India. I was conducting a SOC session for a student and I, I showed them, go and search 3,500 openings in one week. One week and it changes. Every day, it keep adding it. There are no resources. So much opening. So you go and talk about all the MNCs, big companies, and that's also for mainly for process. It's not about experience. They don't have process. Recently, I had an opportunity to you know, be part of one of the group. They said, we need 30 process in UK who has done courses in cybersecurity. They don't need experience. They're saying, if someone can tell what is print testing, as what uh, Dr. Prakash said, you know, they can do about malware analysis, pen testing, then I'm ready to do a job. This is in UK, 30 openings in one company per process. Yeah. So that is a mark, market opportunity. So the question is, okay, there is a huge market, there is opportunities. So where do we start? As academy, we have one side, the curriculum from the universities, that's you know, BS in cybersecurity, MS in cybersecurity, you know, BCA, they include cybersecurity as additional subject. B, computer science, they are keeping cybersecurity selective papers. They are finding difficult to have experts to teach that. I've been called by SSN, you know, in, in Chennai, to talk about, to teach the students on cryptography. They said, sir, we are, it is very difficult. For, and they said, we have a curriculum. I want you to help on the complete curriculum development. We already signed a movie with Viltech and other colleges on how to help them to create labs and R&D labs and practical labs to implement those cybersecurity curriculum. Because it's a huge challenge when you introduce a new thing and you are not prepared, especially fac faculties, how do we expect students to you know, cope up with that? So what we thought, while well, we work with um, uh, universities and academies on, on helping them, we also thought, why don't we create a 40 weeks program, one year program, weekly ones, where we talk all the basic foundation of cybersecurity. So professors, students, or even presses, they can attend and build their opportunity. That is what we have started with cybersecurity essential course. So it's going to cover with network security, ethical hacking, forensics, which uh, you know, Dr. Prakash talked about, which is about malware analysis, how you can do cyber forensic when somebody, when there is an incident, when there is a ransomware attack, when somebody saying that, you know, my confidential data has been leaked or data breach has happened, how, as a forensic investigator, I can go and collect data, data acquisition, and how we can create copies and put it on your cyber forensic lab and use different tools to find out what was the attack, how it has happened, what is the entry point. We teach that in digital forensic course. We give them tools. I complete uh, in the last one week, we had the cyber defense course. You know, more than 60 students were attending also 50 professors have enrolled for that. And they were surprised to see with one tool, I can take the entire hard disk or your mobile phone data, you deleted, you formatted, I could retrieve all of them. I can show them the picture which is saved inside the mobile. I could show, show them the videos, I could show. They were amazed, sir. It, it was, I completely erased, still you can retrieve. And that is what as cyber forensic we do to track cyber criminals. I need to create evidence. Then only I can help, you know, Mr. Siva, you know, for bringing those evidence and take it to the court of law, all right? Then, then I can, because that is a, we, we cannot go to the, uh, you know, uh, cyber, uh, cyber law cannot be applied unless you have clear evidence, unless you can prove that this is, you know, uh, the person was dead. So we talk about that in cyber digital forensic. Okay, everything is fine, but what about monitoring? Cyber defense require a command and control center where I, I want to have a, a you know, single pan of glass view, uh, birds I view on what is happening in my state, in my district, in my organization, in my university. 
I need to have monitoring center. We also teach how you can use different tools to collect data, to trade and use AI, artificial intelligence, to you know, remove those false positive and help you to understand what is happening in your entire you know, digital assets. That's taught in security operations center. So that is what we are going to do as a 40 week course. So this uh, curriculum for each and everything, we talk from fundamentals, physical, technical, you know, even we talk about uh, CCTV, physical security access control, right? Mobile application, IoT, cryptography and PKI, which is part of the, you know, encryption algorithms and monitoring tools. This is on 10 week course, 20 hours, and it has got almost 30 hours practical sessions. Yeah. Then we have ethical hacking, how you can do pen testing, how you can expose the vulnerability from mobile network. So we, we teach them block box testing, gray box, white box, all those kind of different testing with different digital assets from cloud, mobile application, web application, IoT, OT, you know, all of them, they, they understand how it does work. Then we get into forensic, how you can acquire data, how you can duplicate and use on the, how you can defeat on the forensic you know, techniques and also how to do Windows machine, Linux machine, mobile app, like Android and iOS, and how you can do dark web forensic. Because most of the cyber criminals use something called TAR, my TAR browser. They hide, they have complete anonymity. When they browse, nobody can detect them because they use encryption. So we, we, we teach in forensic how you can use dark web forensics. Right? Then most of the business, most of the crime happen using business email compromise. They said 80% of the phishing attack or social engineering attack happen through business email compromise. So we help people to understand how your email was compromised. Did you have any DMARC policy? Is your DNS record is correct? How did they do phishing? So we, we create simulations. All right. Then we do malware forensics. That is all in forensics. And then we teach them security op operation center. You can have a security, security information and event management, a tool which can collect data from your firewall, IPS, you know, antivirus, malware, web application, WAF, whatever you have, endpoint security, network security. <coughs> this tool can collect data and give you a bad eye view of what is happening inside your network. If there is any attack, cyber attack happen, it can put in a timeline that when it happened, how it is spread, how it has gone, like with COVID-19, we all know that, you know, we had a COVID-19 tracking app. So it can have Bluetooth signal or using Bluetooth, it can send if somebody is infected with the COVID-19, you know, once you enter, and it's going to quarantine and tell from who, which person it was, you know, sent to whom, all right? Th those kind of uh, data analytics can be given with cyber, you know, SIM tools. That is what we teach in SOC, yeah? So something which we want to help our team to, uh, our students to get, you, you know, make use of this because it's, uh, we are starting with uh, very, very affordable uh, material. It's also from Easy Council. We also have Fortinet and Palo Alto, all those things they can use. And mainly we don't want to do with, you know, theories, we want to cover with labs. Tools. So at the end of the session, the guy will be able to use Metasploit. Yesterday, I was in one of the organization of 150 clients across the globe. They have a product in cloud. They said, Brian, I want your company to help me to do vulnerability assessment pen testing. I asked them, what is the tool you use? Our team use Pursuit Enterprise. So imagine 150 MNCs across the globe, US, UK, and their vulnerability assessment is done with Pursuit. Now the question for me and you, if our students, they know how to use PubSort, don't you think those companies will have a red carpet to our students? They say, hey, uh, hello, you know about these tools, you know, you know how to use it, come and join us. That's what they're looking at. So we're going to talk about Kali Linux, Nessus, Autospy is again, uh, 
you know, um, for cyber forensic tools, virus total is the malware analysis tools, open bias is, was is the vulnerability assessment tool. So we are going to talk about frameworks and stuff like that. So students will know at the end of the 40 uh, sessions, all these tools. These are some of the lab screenshot with Kali next Parrot OS, all the tools will be pre-built and loaded in your laptop. So you are free to run that and use it for learning purposes, all right? So that is how, how to speak. So at the end of the session, 40 uh, different course, you will have 14-Ed, Triacne, Palalto and CodeRed. This is the certification you can get, all right? Our students already work in this and some of them already, as Madam uh, Revati Ma'am said, a lot of professors now, they already completed Palalto, 14-Ed, Recently, they also completed pen testing course. Right now, they are doing cyber defense. I think by Monday, most of them will come with cyber defense certifications. And they know how to use Autospy, all the tools, you know, cyber forensic tools. That's where we are differing from others. We want to tell them, use the tool, hands-on labs. That's why they can improve their you know, things. And also, we do on-site training. For example, this is the program which is happening in Miyasi. Almost, I think, 30 students, if I'm not mistaken, we are giving 10 weeks hands-on training on the students. All these things are taught on the campus, right? We are also doing for our bills. There are almost 35 students coming and learning in our premises on a, you know, almost 10 days every day they're coming, learning an internship program where we help them to learn all the tools, get certified, give them the project work so that they can also submit this part of their uh, university you know, <clears throat> submitted for the internship schools. Yeah. This is another program we did in Veltech. Uh, this is the, um, you know, Dean of Veltech, uh, you know, computer science, or I think electronics, where we had two weeks, two days programs to teach students about all the tools. And at the end of this course, they all get certified from ethical hacking, from Triagme and other major vendors. Yeah. So also we help in R&D. We already proposed for Veltech and also a couple of other universities where we want to help them and build a SOC lab within the university campus. So we can install OpenVAS or you know, <clears throat> Wazoo, this is another tool, which is used by Facebook and Google for SOC monitoring. So it's an open source tool. We can help the university to install and monitor the entire infrastructure and ask the students to come and do research on those tools. So we are ready to do that for our universities already be tied up and we can also create entrepreneurs opportunities inside the campus because we want to give them open source tools and product development tools. So it can create an ecosystem where students can tie up with startup Tamil Nadu or any other startup India where they can come up with innovative ideas in products or ideas. They can, we can help till they become um, MVP products and you know put them into the uh, startup um, ecosystems you know that we can do that so what is required we need certain solutions monitors desktops <clears throat> and servers if you provide it we can come up with our tools and we can do it everything on the campus and they can you know work on that monitor the entire things and also for product development um we need students to come up with some kind of training on Python uh, and also React JS, another node, all of them we will train, train them. And also we'll ask them to use the tools to how to create cybersecurity products so that they can also benefit from creating new product ideas and bring them to the market. So the questions everybody will have right now. So still it says, okay, we talked so much things, you know, 40 weeks, I cannot afford, you know, uh, can you talk about the uh, simple things, solution? So we have a very good opportunity. It's called, all these four courses are called micro-credential. It's not connected to each other. Once you do 10 weeks, you get network defense. Once you have 10 weeks, you can get ethical hacking. So it's not interconnected, but if you can do all the four, that means you are ready for all the technologies or all the greater spectrum of cybersecurity. So what do you want to do? We want to start network defense, which is starting next week, every Sunday, 10 to 12. We are going to launch this course free of cost for all the faculties and students. Faculty will have all the 40 week course free. As Revati Mam said, my or our ambition is to, you know, train faculty so that they can train students. 
we have a lofty vision of creating 1 million cybersecurity professionals. This cannot be done by training institutes because that's a lot of factors in what money, you know, capacity. But if you can use the existing organizations, the existing universities and academia and train faculties so that they can embody this knowledge to the students, that is what our objective is. Yeah. So we want to have this 40 weeks program for all the faculties free. For students, they can onboard the first course as free of cost. But if you want to do second, third, they have to pay a bit of amount like 3,000 rupees. And you all can welcome to join this course. Maybe you can quickly scan this and it can take you to that. Next Saturday, we are starting this. I request all those who have joined this program, please take this screenshot and share it to your friends and colleagues and encourage them to start. It's not going to cost anything, you know? but imagine after one year, if you can try, you know, thousand, I'm, I'm talking about a minimum thousand faculties and 10,000 students in this program, when they come out, you know, at least we are fulfilling 0.1% of the job demand. That's my objective. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, let us fill the 35 lakhs jobs. No, I'm talking even if we take 0.1% of the job, like 35,000 jobs or 3,500 jobs, if we can create, that's wonderful. Then it can create as a ripple effect and we can enlarge in the next year. So I thank everyone for, you know, listening to me. And definitely uh, we have a lot of opportunities to go. And, and in fact, we have a website. This is the website where you can just click and come and learn. We have something for schools. We have something for colleges, as we talk about. You know, this is a program for colleges, which we are launching. And also we are having something for working professionals. Yeah. So please spread this word and let us together create a you know, cyber aware world, which can protect our country. Because we foresee uh, cyber security become a major tool in cyber warfare. So if we can uh, create our resources, students to become a cyber warriors, to protect our nation, our state, you know, our district, our family, and that we are doing a great, you know, social service. We are doing a great, you know, service to the entire nation. So with that, I would like to thank everyone. I thank this opportunity. Thanks this up to all of you for participating. Let us have this spirit that this cybersecurity is about national importance. It is of national interest. And I want to play a role to protect my nation's security. With that last message, I thank everyone. Sultan, back to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ibrahim. It's, it's absolutely inspiring. You know, the re reason you, me, uh, Dr. Revati, uh, uh, Dr. Balaji, Dr. Vijay Kumar, Dr. Uh, Shivana, and also uh, Vanita Madam here is not just about empowering students, but the higher cause is like looking after the national security. Um, today, you know, uh, it is absolutely uh, possible that anybody can get invasive about um uh, in, in national security in terms of playing its finance, banks, um, even hacking our phones to IoT devices, to uh, cars, you know, wherever there is an internet connection and there's a computer, there's a high possibility someone can intrude um, and uh, damage a reputation or financial reputation. So thank you so much for giving all these perspectives. It's, it's a one of its kind webinar that I've never been a part of like this before. Uh, speaking from academia to curriculum to the gap between industry and uh, academia, uh, the importance of uh, um, having cybersecurity in startups to uh, business ventures to national security is uh, national policies as well um, is one of its kind combination of everything one need to know. And I think this webinar has served a great mileage for the students to understand the importance of cybersecurity and its education. Um, with that note, I thank you all for joining me here today. And Dr. Ibrahim, uh, there are quite a few questions that have uh, flown into and I, I would like to ask them to you. Um, as a students, how do we start our career in cybersecurity? Yeah, I, I think I've uh, explained to you, 
it's something where we need to start with understanding the networks, the networking principle, operating system like Windows, Linux, and a little bit of programming in Python. That's what we cover in the basics of uh, you know cybersecurity basics. Because if you create a strong foundation, understand that, then sky is the limit, right? So you start with that, then we have a recorded content. Probably I'll share those courses. Even we have a recorded content worth of 5,000 rupees. I'm going to give it for all those who are registered for the webinar as a free. So you can use a coupon code, straight away get into our academy and learn, start building your basic foundation as a recorded content. Yeah, that's how you can do it, uh, Abdul Samad. Yeah. Any other questions? You. I have a personal question, Dr. Ibrahim, and this is a question that's been asked to me quite a few times around uh, someone who do not have any computer science background. You know, I know Dr. Revati is an expert uh, in her field and she has a very strong computer background or programming background. Um, there are many other people who do not have that computer background can also, is it possible for them to jump into cybersecurity to learn some of the fundamentals and become a cybersecurity expert in the future? Yeah, that, that's a wonderful question, uh, Sultan. Um, see, when you look at cybersecurity, as I told you, it touches all aspects of our life, right? We're talking about now, Mr. Balaji has talked about the smart cities. He is a research professor. He is now concerned about cybersecurity. Dr. Vijay Kumar is concerned about cybersecurity. So why? Dr. You know, uh, Mr. Siva, he is concerned about cybersecurity. So cybersecurity, I want to thing beyond technology. It's not a technical, no more a technical jargon word, which we always think like AI, robotics, you know, IoT. Yeah, this could be something limited, but cybersecurity is touching on each and every aspect of our life. Every day, you know, if you talk about the mobile gadgets, you know, it's, it's there with everyone. So how I can sleep whether I have a proper privacy in my mobile phone, proper security in my mobile phone, so it touches each and every one. That's what I want to say. It's for everyone, first thing. Second, we have great opportunity in cybersecurity. It's not about technical stuff. There is something called governance, risk and compliance, am I right? And also there is something called cybersecurity management, MBA graduates, bachelors. They can start as a product managers. They can start with <clears throat> marketing in cybersecurity. They can sell cybersecurity concepts in sales. You know, if you are in statistics, I talked about uh, recently in Etiraj College for statistics students, all women, girls, they were saying, sir, what I have to do with cybersecurity? I said, Math mathematics and statistics is the core principle for all technological innovation. I always believe anyone who has come from mathematic background, they are the one who are bright. They, they, their ideas, they are open, they think, and it has been proved that most of the innovation in the industry that all start from mathematics. So you once you have mathematics, you have something in your you know a great arsenal, you know great uh, knowledge with you. You can explore any field. Data science, you know, it requires you know big data requires statistics and mathematics. Cyber security is it requires. So it's about how we you know foresee or how we see we will fit. Our capabilities will fit into cybersecurity. So I had one map. Unfortunately, I could not show it here. It has got almost seventy-five small job uh, you know, profiles in cybersecurity and ten branches, starting from governance, starting from you know teaching, starting from product development, starting from risk and compliance, starting from auditing. Like we are talking about chartered accountants, they go and audit firms, right? And especially we know that after GST. Everybody is behind chartered accountant, am I right? We, every month we need to file. So they are becoming the most busiest person today in the industry. I think nobody can deny that. Even for personal filing, you know, I need to, if I have a small firm, every month I need to file, otherwise I get a notification from my IT department. So imagine that's a case going to be in one or two years. If you're not complying with your penetration testing, vulnerability assessment, you're not, Complying with government regulation, I, like what uh, Mr. Siva was talking about, you will be penalized. They can penalize up to 500 crores is happening in India. November 2022, they have put a draft bill on personal data production in India. And if it is passed, that means they can penalize up to 500 crores. 
So they will be ready to look for anyone who has cyber auditors, cyber security auditors, to help them to make sure I'm complying with these policies. So even I had a student uh, from UK who is a doctor, who is a professional medical institute, a medical, medical uh, doctor. He is running his own hospital and is around 55 years old. I asked, doctor, what cyber security, why are you are joining this course? He said, now I need to comply on HIPAA, you know, health, you know, health insurance policy act. So I am running a hospital. I need to know how I am securing my patient's data. I'm bringing XYZ companies, but are they doing rightly? So I want to know what is cybersecurity. I was really amazed to see a medical doctor, professional doctor at 55 years old, running his own hospital in UK, joining a cybersecurity course. So that this is just to throw a light on what kind of you know, change is happening in the industry. I think this would be enough to talk about who can start his career in cybersecurity. I think you're mute. Oh, yes. So thank you. That was uh, one of its uh, very, very convincing explanation that everybody should start to understand cybersecurity and involve in cybersecurity in one or other way. Um, with no doubt, I completely agree with you. Today, our children play with mobile phones. Um, in the Western world, children play with computers and Wi-Fi and all sort of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning and uh, data interfaced um, um, gadgets. So today it has not just become a requirement for elders or people who are grown up. Today it's a requirement for the children as well. So with all that note, and I thank you, uh, Dr. Ibrahim, for your uh, very kind time and all the panelists for your um vision and also your words and actions that uh, that will make cybersecurity a truly uh, important lesson that we all need to learn through which i'm sure it's going to bring a revolution in our country in terms of securing our digital uh, uh, gadgets and assets that will in turn define our national security as well and i'm very certain the more and more sensitization and awareness and discussion that goes uh, evolve around, that will make strong policies as well for our country. So what we are doing is a ground level um, revolution that will that that is going to change quite a lot of hierarchical order in how we govern uh, data uh, for us and also for the future generation as well. So with that uh, note, I thank you all for joining me and I thank all the participants for. Uh, being here very enthusiastically. There's quite a lot of people have turned up on the YouTube channel as well. Um, I'm very certain this have given an insight for you of what you want to know and probably everything that you want to know about cybersecurity. And you will hear more webinars from us and more events from us uh, to constantly engage you uh, in the in the spectrum of cybersecurity. So uh, I thank you all once again and thank you so much for joining us. Have the rest of the beautiful Saturday. Thank you. Can you also ask them to leave the feedback? There is a LinkedIn post. Probably they can yeah. put their questions and also leave their feedback in there. Yeah. Absolutely. There's a LinkedIn post around on the comment. And I request all of you to take that uh, uh, point and uh, you can share all your comments and suggestions that you want to uh, help us improve also. Uh, at the same time, if you have any specific questions, uh, we are happy to answer to you privately as well. And if necessary, we will also schedule a call with you to discuss more about uh, the sort of questions you have. So thank you once again. Take good care of you. Thank you.